Conquer the Noise is a podcast produced by Unconquered, an independent agency challenging brand perspective to redefine content. This podcast is dedicated to telling stories of outstanding ideas and people who have found their way amongst the chatter. Hi, everyone. This is Jonathan Hansen, Chief Creative Officer at Unconquered, and I'm your host of Cultivating Purpose and Passion in Business. Today, we have Jeremiah McKelvey, Chief Merchandising Officer at Thrive Market, which is a membership-based retailer offering natural and organic food products on the show. If you're a big food nerd, you'll love this episode as we talk about how they ensure they carry healthy and sustainably made products. But before you kick things off, I want to put it out there that I need your help. Reviews are the best way for this show to grow, and I would really appreciate if you head on over to the Apple Podcast app and leave a review. All right, Jeremiah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be here. Hey, Jeremiah. So I've had uh, a great time just sort of digging into Thrive uh, Market these last couple of days in preparation for our podcast. And um, I would I would love it if you could tell our audience t- today what Thrive Market is and, and um, what it's all about. Sure. Actually, we are an online membership club model. So we're very similar to uh, what your audience may be familiar with, with Costco, Sam's Club, um, except for we're all online. We have no brick and mortar locations. So our members pay an annual membership fee of, of $60. And um, with that, we donate a free membership to a lower income family, teacher, military veteran, or first responder. So our mission is to democratize healthy products to all Americans. And um, whether you're limited because of budget or whether you're limited because of geography and just lack of availability in the community you live in, that's what we're trying to solve for. So it's uh, we have a hyper curated product assortment. So we have about a little over 5,000 different products and uh, they range everything from non you know, packaged grocery products that you'll find in the grocery store to mm-hmm. grass-fed beef and meat and seafood that arrives at your door frozen to organic and clean wines. Um, and then also personal care, nutritional supplements, home goods. So really we try to run the gamut and cover off all categories that you would find at your local health food store or grocery store. So you're, you're definitely not, um, new to this industry. You've been in, in the natural food business for your whole career. Mostly what inspires you to get into to this line of work? Yeah. I'm in my 27th year right now, soon to be 28 here coming up on my anniversary. Oh, and- congratulations. Thanks. It's been quite fun. I mean, I am at the stage of my life where I couldn't imagine doing anything else with my uh-huh. life. Um, but it really, for me, um, came out of some health challenges I had when I was a younger person and and just growing up eating the standard American diet and then moving up to Boston to go to college mm-hmm. and just applying for a job at a small organic juice bar. And at the time, as I said, had a bunch of health issues and did a bunch of reading in the store while we had downtime where we didn't have customers. And it ended up changing my my health pretty radically. And from there, I became a convert and an evangelist, mm-hmm. I guess you could say, where mm-hmm. I said to myself, I have to, I have to spread the word. I have to spread the gospel of, mm-hmm. of living naturally and eating clean food and um, avoiding processed food and, and avoiding the center American diet. And, and uh, so that, you know, led me to drop out of college to uh, sell organic juice. And from there, um, I've been fortunate in my career to wear a number of different hats, um, literally from working with farmers in Panama, um, planting cacao plants, all the way up to um, being the executive global coordinator for health and beauty at Whole Foods Market for a number of years and having a lot of kind of game changing work that I was able to be in a position to help facilitate. And then uh, in 2013, joined the startup team at Thrive Market and and uh, been doing that for the last seven years nearly. And it's been quite an amazing journey and a fun ride. And along the way, built so many friendships and relationships and partnerships and learned so much and continue to learn every day, uh, which Mm -hmm. is incredibly exciting. Well, I I have a ton of questions I want to get through, but I always love hearing the stories of how people make these transformations in their lives when they when they notice they felt they felt one way, started educating themselves, and then made efforts to change, and actually felt felt and saw a huge difference yeah. after after implementing these changes. Um, was this all diet specific? Was it 
vitamin specific or how did you sort of start curating and changing um, your habits to, to, to yeah, have a more you know, beneficial and healthier lifestyle? It's a great question. I always tell people that I did not grow up in a hippie commune and most yeah. people that most people that do what I do for 30 years um, have some roots from their family or some mm -hmm. something that encouraged them on this path and I really didn't I was um, my mom was a single mom worked at a grocery store worked 50 60 hours a week to to get the overtime to be able to afford for us to live and um, I ended up eating a lot of you know processed food fast food whatever we could really afford at the time mm -hmm. and drank a lot of soda pop and, you know, all the things, all the, you know, and so I, by the time I got up to Boston and was going to school, I was in pretty bad shape. I had a lot of digestive issues. I had a lot of problems. And for me, it was a, to your question, it was a combination of mm -hmm. radically changing my diet. And I always tell people, interestingly enough about the human body, in my, my opinion, the things that you avoid, the negatives that you avoid are almost as impactful as the mm. positives that you do. And mm -hmm. for me, it was not going to McDonald's every day anymore, right? And not mm -hmm. eating processed fast food every day and then starting to eat whole foods and mm -hmm. really moving to eating fresh fruits and vegetables, which sounds so basic, right? But um, at the time, I just really wasn't doing that. And then also drinking water and uh, drinking clean <laughs> water and, and uh, not drinking soda and other high calorie, high sugar drinks. And, and mm -hmm. then uh, in addition to that, I added in dietary fiber supplements. I added in probiotics, um, which I am still a huge evangelist of to this day. Mm -hmm. And then I focused on eating a lot of green foods and eating a lot of high nutritionally dense foods while I was eliminating all of the bad stuff, if you will. And um, it took about six months. I was fortunate at the, the, my first job in the industry, I worked in an environment where almost everyone on the staff had some expertise, whether it was Western nutrition, whether it was Chinese medicine or Ayurveda or, mm -hmm. um, or Eastern nutrition, if you will. And um, I was able to pick a lot of brains while I was chopping carrots at this juice mm -hmm. bar. And, um, and they dropped pearls of wisdom on me all the time. And it really shaped uh, what I did and how I lived. And within about six months of really diving in, I had seen just a radical transformation. I remember eating a meal and actually feeling energy from my food, which I mean, again, sounds so basic to most people. But I never had that experience where I actually ate and felt like, like wow, I feel great. Like I actually mm -hmm. feel feel energy and, and vibrancy from my food. So it was an, a light bulb moment for me. And um, I also grew up surfing and skateboarding. And so there was mm -hmm. this countercultural element to natural and organic products mm -hmm. where I felt like I was kind of in the know and a little punk rock. And uh, it was pretty exciting to me to be like bucking the system and feeling like I was spreading information that maybe in my opinion was not readily available. I had never heard of this mm -hmm. stuff when I was growing mm -hmm. up. So, um, so it was, it was exciting and then also revolutionary for me to be able to be regular and, and feel good when I ate food and not have cramps and not be debilitated mm -hmm. um, my digestive system, which is something so many people take for granted. I mean, mm -hmm. I have children now and, I've been fortunate to be able to feed them healthy, organic food most of their lives. And I watch them just thriving with no issues and very healthy and hardly ever getting sick and very strong. And, you know, and I'm like, wow, see, it really does work. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, not just for me, but watching them grow up in that environment. So, so, so after your, um, after working the juice store, is that when you went on to Whole Foods? I left uh, the juice bar and moved out to Boulder, Colorado. And uh -huh. so I had some jobs working for different vitamin stores and things. And then Whole Foods Market happened to be opening a location in Boulder, Colorado. Uh -huh. um, this was 1997. Uh -huh. um, so it was very, it was a very transformative moment for the natural products industry because yeah. prior to that, Wild Oats and Alfalfa has kind of had a monopoly in the Boulder, Colorado area. Whole Foods had never gone into that market. And so there happened to be a little hiring shack across from where the, the Whole Foods would be later. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back to that hiring shack <laughs> three or four times before they would hire me because I they were just like, we have enough people. We don't need anyone else. 
And I was just very persistent being young and, you know, pounding on the door, please hire mm-hmm. me. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I actually took a job at their juice bar there because mm-hmm. it was the only place that would hire me and then worked my way up to being a system manager of health and beauty. And, um, that was started my journey with whole foods, which lasted the better part of 16 years in different capacities. So, uh, it was another one of those turning point moments of, a little persistence pays off and working yeah. way up from the ground level. And, um, but I was fortunate along the way too. So while you were there, um, you know, you, you established industry changing quality standard initiatives for natural beauty standards and organic laboring requirements, uh, for personal care and, um, worked with sustainable packaging guidelines with, with, within Whole Foods. And I would love to see, hear like what you were seeing that you thought needed all that change. You know, obviously you, you saw that something could have been done better and started pushing for that. Um, and w- what was that? Yeah, it's like, I, it goes back to a point I made a minute ago, which is I just have this, I've always had this little punk rock edge to me where uh-huh. I, I get frustrated, you know, I get frustrated with the world around me and, um, and, seeing people struggle and seeing the world kind of not go in the right way. And for some reason, I realized early on that market is really powerful. And, you know, voting with your dollar is maybe the most important thing we do. I mean, we take mm-hmm. it for granted. We, we live in a, in a consumer culture and we've been conditioned to, you know, be exposed to a lot of advertising and, you know, mm-hmm. everyone wants your dollar. But at the end of the day, where you choose to spend your money Uh, drives what happens in our country more than anything else we do, in my opinion, Mm -hmm. more than policy, more than, more than government, more than anything. Mm -hmm. So um, the global coordinator job for health and beauty at Whole Foods was my dream job. And so for me though, that didn't mean driving sales and margin and all those retail, retail buzzwords that you hear all the time. It meant the ability to have a platform to work with broad groups of suppliers that are doing incredible work in the world, pull them together and be able to make some real systemic change. And at the time, Whole Foods, I mean, you got to remember this was, you know, 15 years ago and uh, Whole Foods was it. I mean, Whole Foods was the world leader of natural and organic, and there was not a lot of other options. Even in mass market stores, grocery stores, there weren't very many organic products even back then. And so, we were driving a lot of change and we were on the cutting edge of innovation in terms of raising the bar on standards, ingredients, quality, sustainability. And so we looked at that opportunity. I say we as like the global purchasing team at Whole Foods as a way to create real change and bring our suppliers to Austin and talk to them, not about just, Hey, how much more cost of goods are you going to give us? Uh, Anybody can do that. Right. Um, It's not rocket science. But how do we actually get into your supply chains together? How do you, how do we get you guys talking to each other and talking to us and our stores and our customers about how to create change? What are the thing, what are the areas of opportunity that you can look at and say, wow, we're actually doing more harm than good with creating this super clean organic food. Um, we're creating more packaging waste or we're creating these byproduct ingredients that shouldn't be in the, in the environment. And so um, for me, it was more that awareness of, mm-hmm. hey, we have an opportunity here beyond just how do we, again, how do we pad the bottom line to how do we raise the bar so that mm-hmm. people can vote for their dollar with their dollar and have better things to vote on and mm-hmm. really drive market change. And whether that's fair trade or organic or packaging. Um, it's pretty powerful and it continues to be. I mean, I feel fortunate at Thrive that we've been able to pick up that torch and even move it to the next place and continue to do so. Uh, because again, in, in this world, uh, we're so divided by politics and by so many things, but the things we can usually agree on are clean water and clean air yeah. and healthy children are really important, right? And yeah. uh, so we can impact that. Yeah, and so uh, now at your in your position at Thrive, you know you're you're doing similar work, working, selecting, and picking a lot of the brands that are are sold through Thrive. And I'm curious, you know, you touched a bit on um, supply chain and, and making sure that even though you may have a really healthy, clean product, um, that the way it's produced or the packaging or maybe the way it's shipped or all these other details um, are 
also not being overlooked. And, and I'm curious to how you are, and that's, that's a really complicated process and it, it seems overwhelming. So I'm curious to how you handle that uh, for Thrive and, and the types of questions and conversations you're having with your uh, supply chain partners. Yeah, you said the magic word there at the end too, it's questions, right? Uh-huh. Like we, uh, we ask a lot of questions. And so uh-huh. our whole team, we're fortunate to have a whole merchandising team that, that talks to suppliers every day, whether it's third-party branded suppliers or whether it's for our, our Thrive Market brand private label. And we don't just you know get their email with their self pitch and go, sure, that looks great. Um, <laughs> we really, you know, that's the first step. We love third-party certifications for the record. We yeah. love seeing the USDA organic seal. We love seeing some kind of ethical trading uh, certification. We love you know, the myriad of other certifications that exist, whether it's FSC or solar powered or wind powered, all of those are fantastic. And they show us that people are paying attention. And then we start asking our questions, right? So then mm-hmm. we start asking, you know, what about this ingredient? Why is that in there? Where does that come from? I've never heard of that. Can you give me the, the background around how that's produced, what the starting material is? And, you know, usually when you start asking questions, five more pop up, right? Yeah. Like, oh, that ingredient's derived from corn. Okay, is it non-GMO corn? Is it organic? Where's the corn being grown? Um, and then you're, from there, you know, diving deeper and deeper, and you kind of go down the rabbit hole in every product, which um, I often tell our team, it's feel very fortunate we only have a curated catalog because if we had yeah. uh, 50,000 products, we'd be literally um, spending all of our time doing this. Um, it makes it a little easier to be able to have a curated list, but, Um, And, you know, we hear oftentimes from our supplier partners, wow, no one ever asked us that. Like no one's ever asked us where this ingredient comes from or why we use it. And the other thing I've observed, especially on the food side of the business, is that so much of what's done and what happens in the food system in the United States is simply a byproduct of that's how it's always been done before. And so there's a lot of, you know, we'll get a lot of products that have, added gums or added binders or preservatives or fillers or extra sugar. And we'll just ask the question, like, why do you use xanthan gum in this product? And like, well, I don't really know. It's just always been in this kind of product. And we're like, have Mm -hmm. you ever tried to run it without that? And, um, you know, can we get a sample of that without that ingredient? And can Mm -hmm. we simplify it? You know, um, our plant milks are a great, great example of that where, you know, our ingredients are oats and water and we're going, you know, when we first got the product, it was oats, water, xanthan gum, you know, carrageenan, salt, you know, sugar. And we're going, why, why were all these ingredients in there? <laughs> and, uh, and then you get a sample and you try it and it's absolutely amazing. And you're going, mm-hmm. Oh, wow. Why? Well, this is what our customers always, this is the formula we always had. So, um, so it's quite fascinating. And at the end of the day, I, I wish I had some exotic, um, scientific answer for you, mm-hmm. but it's quite simple, right? It's deduction and questions. And, um, you know, my team would say, it's not that easy. Like we're spending a lot of time on this. <laughs> um, what are you talking about? But, um, but it really is just human communication and partnership and really having that strive to mm-hmm. make better products for customers and make cleaner products for families and, um, you know, make the healthiest product that we can make and, and ship to people's homes. And this is this is a little off topic, but you brought up xanthium gum, and I see it on labels all the time. And I was actually reading about it last week a little a little bit. I didn't dive too much into it. It's really a a, a um, stabilizer or like a th- thickening agent. Is that right? Yep. Is it toxic, or is there is it? Should we be avoiding that? It depends on who you talk to. I mean, that's uh-huh. the other um, that's the other thing is. I mean, in my career, I've always tried to be quite pragmatic about ingredients because. Um, one thing I've learned is, you know, for every person that markets the bad side of an ingredient, there's someone that markets yeah. the good side and science yeah. is always conflicting. I mean, we've lived through that in spades this past year, but, um, I've heard conflicting reports. I, I know a lot of the, um, leading nutritional, you know, nutritionists and people who, um, are focused in the wellness space. Uh, really believe that just any added gums, any any added ingredients that are unnecessary should be avoided. And mm-hmm. you know, I on a personal level, I tend to live my life on the precautionary principle. So I tend to be a little more cautious. Um, 
I eat products with xanthan gum, so I'm mm -hmm. not one of those people that's a zealot that says, no, absolutely no gums or stabilizers. Um, I do think that wherever you can eliminate extra ingredients, why not? You know, let's keep it simple. Let's have whole food ingredients. And um, so I know that that's a straddling the fence answer for you, but it's the, kind of the way I look at things. I look at ingredients case by case, really study all the science. And I think the jury, ultimately for me, the jury's still out on the gums mm -hmm. and stabilizers. Um, and it's really hard because there's such small amounts of them in products where they do appear that it's hard to say that they're causing any long-term health you know, detriment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. unless you're really consuming a lot of them, which most the average consumer is not. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mentioned this before we jumped on the podcast today, but we have a lot of, of guests and listeners who make products that are, would likely, um, qualify for, um, placement inside of a, a market like thrive. And I'm curious to what your process is like. You touched on a little bit that people, they send you pitches and stuff all the time. So what is it like? What can you walk me through the process of, of what it's like to get a product, um, you know, on the site at Thrive? Yeah. The, I mean, the number one place to start, and this will sound a bit cliche, but it's true, is we have on our website, we have a brand partnerships page, mm -hmm. uh, which is just thrivemarket.com brand slash brand dash partnership stuff, you know, and you go there and there's a whole way you can just submit your products online. So okay. um, that's the first step because those go right to our category managers and then they're able to review them and really identify if they have an interest in receiving samples or want to know more information. So um, once you do that, you're, you're in the queue, so to speak. Um, now, the important thing to remember there is we get literally thousands of submissions. So sure. we we'll, don't expect an answer the next day. It will take a yeah. few weeks, but they will get back to you and uh, beyond that, like the nuts and bolts of that process, I think the important thing to remember, and we talked about it at the top, is that we're highly curated. So we say no a whole lot more than we say yes. Mm -hmm. um, and we're really looking for innovative companies. And when I say that, I don't mean somebody who's making something crazy that we've never seen before, per se. We do love those sometimes, but mm -hmm. really we're looking for people who are pushing the envelope on, on the mission front, um, mm -hmm. have a deep social mission or are raising the bar in terms of ingredient standards, like I was talking about a second ago. Um, are you making a product that is cleaner than anything else that's ever been available in your category? Are you making a product that packaging system that's totally sustainable, that's unique and different and tastes great and is an incredible offering? Um, those are the items we're looking for. We're looking for disruptors, we're looking for brands that are changing the game, um, mm -hmm. not just, you know, another organic white rice, I guess. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, um, and, and so, I mean, you talked about a little bit earlier about, you know, your early education process and now you're getting all these influx of products yourself and you, you are curating them, um, which, you know, does require close scrutiny. And I would imagine tasting and using these pr products as well. So I'm curious to what that's like for you. And um, I mean, do you have, do you have a pantry at home that has 3000 products in it or what, what is that? What's that like for you? Yeah, it's, well, I'll tell you, it is an absolute delight to have a team. Um, so we yeah. have category managers that own specific areas of business, which saves me from having 3000 products. Now I do uh -huh. have dozens of products at any <laughs> time. Um, my, we recently had spring break here in Austin and we, my family was away for about a week and a half. And, uh, -huh. uh when we came home, the whole entryway was full of boxes and samples. And, um, so we do, I do get an influx of, of product samples. We try obviously everything we get and uh -huh. we really test everything. Um, I often tell people it's like, we end up spending a lot of time talking about the questions and the standards and the guidelines and the ingredients. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, if a product doesn't taste great and doesn't, or doesn't work well, if it's a home product or a personal care product, mm -hmm. Um, or has a bad ingredient on the ingredient deck, like that's a non-starter. We can't proceed. We're also fully non-GMO on the food side. So if we have, if we don't have verification that a product's free of GMOs, then, you know, that's a non-starter for us too. Or if it has mm -hmm. an artificial flavor color preservative in it, 
that's a non-starter. So I often tell people, I'm like, first of all, know our standards before you submit, mm -hmm. because otherwise you're wasting your time mm -hmm. and ultimately our, our time. But, uh, but yeah, like for us, it starts with a great product, right? And then mm -hmm. we dive in. And um, so it's, it's, it's amazing having a team of passionate people that care about quality, care about experience, and ultimately the, delivering our members the best possible products. So, you know, I've I've always been fascinated by the um, like house brand of groceries, like the private labeling. Um, and you know, speaking of Whole Foods, they've really built out their 365 brand over the last few years, and um, it looks like Thrive is on that same trajectory as, as far as building out a strong portfolio of their own curated uh, products. Um, so. I would love to get a little insight into that. And, and I think that would also just help our customers understand the value of, of the um, private labeling. So could you walk me through um, how that works? Are you actually like growing these things? Are you producing these things or what's the process there? Yeah, it's a great question. We, um, we realized early on uh, as we launched back in 2014 that as soon as we had any sort of scale, the best way we could raise the bar in terms of quality and also deliver more affordable products to our members was mm -hmm. private label. Um, mm -hmm. Because ultimately all, all CBG brands, you know, any brand that you find in a grocery store has a budget for sales and marketing, whether it's a massive one where they're spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars on Super Bowl ads, or whether mm -hmm. it's just a simple one where they're sampling products in stores and, you know, getting sales reps out to help put products on the shelf or whatever that is. When you have a private brand, you don't have that budget, right? Especially mm -hmm. in our model, because we're shipping direct to people's homes, we, we're just not paying those fees associated with products. So we're able to mm -hmm. keep the product costs way down anywhere from, you know, 15% to, to 40% less than you'll find with a, with a leading brand. What makes our products unique is that we never look at it as, oh, how do we find the most affordable, highest margin product to sell, we look at it as what does our member really want and what does our category really need? And how do we, again, how do we raise the bar? Um, is there a way to take a product that's always been grown conventionally and make it organic? Is there an area of an ingredient or a product that's being sourced from a developing country that has notorious labor rights violations or, or, um, externalized costs and some other factor, are we able to save, save that or raise the bar in terms of ethical sourcing there? So for us, um, I have a personal saying on our team, which is we're not trying to solve one problem, which is accessibility to natural and organic products for all Americans and create several others in other parts of the world that yeah. do that. we're trying to actually help all boats rise and help everyone be healthier on the planet while we, while we have great healthy food. So um, so we always view through that lens when we're developing our private brand and we've been able to, to your question about how, how does it happen? We've been able to run the gamut of some, some of our products. We work all the way down at the farm level where I've personally been out to many of the farms and, and met with people who grow the food that's in our products, um, all the way up to just some amazing kind of uh, sourcing agents that we've found and done business with. Again, some of it dates back to my previous lives where I've met some of these people over the years mm -hmm. at Nespa West in different places and um, being in a position now where because we have two of our own warehouses, we have our own website, we don't have these massive clunky distribution chains, yeah. we don't have a thousand stores to put these products in. It makes it so simple to order them, get them into our warehouse, sell them to our members. And um, and conversely, I mean, the last thought I, I want to share that makes, to me, it's very exciting as a, mm -hmm. as a food geek, but um, we're able to also work with really small scale farmers. And we don't have the pressure that some of the brick and mortar retailers have where it's like, oh, if we only buy 400 of those, that's only one per store and then we're sold out and then we have shelf space and all these ripple effect challenges. We're able to say like, Oh, we really love your product. We'll take everything that you have this year. And, and then how about we grow together and, and really be more patient and um, mm -hmm. really work with farmers, as you know, or likely know, and most people kind of grok is, you know, farming is not a science, right? It's an art and, 
and it ta- and you're at the mercy of mother nature and oftentimes you're going to have crop fails you're going to have natural disaster you're going to have any myriad of factors that can affect mm-hmm. your yield and if you have an un- impatient pr- partner um, that can put your farm under so we're mm-hmm. in a very amazing position to be able to partner with these farmers and partner with growers and producers in a way that we say like, okay, well, we're disappointed that this happened Mm -hmm. and we feel bad for you, but how do we help? How do we support? And how can we be here when you're ready again? Um, Or how can we help you grow and scale because our members love your product, right? And Uh and we're able to test at a much smaller scale without the risk. So, And I'm sure not having to compete uh, for shelf space, reducing the amount of middle uh, men that the products travel through all keep the prices down. And that's where we're, why we're seeing some of the great pricing on Thrive. Um, is, that, is that an accurate sort of um, analysis? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's almost unfair, right? Uh, yeah, as, no, it's as, great. <laughs> I love to our it. competitors, it's really <laughs> great for our members, but it's, um, it's so true. And we, I mean, it's strategic, right? Like we mm-hmm. view ourselves... Um, I, I, again, I'm old enough that I shopped food cooperatives in Boston and, and then here in Austin, even we have some great food cooperatives and we view ourselves as member owned, right? So Mm -hmm. for us, we're always, we're not like, oh, we're offering a great value. We're done. We're good. We're always Mm -hmm. like, how do we continue to offer greater value? How do we continue to bring down prices further? How do we continue to make the membership more, have more value? Um, most members save their membership fee in their first two orders if they're placing a normal size order, which means you save $60 on your first two orders. Um, I know my family, we've been ordering for nearly seven years. We've saved over 20 grand. So I'm, wow. I'm sitting there, I'm sitting wow. there with kids going, well, that's college tuition. Like that's a year of tuition. Yeah. Easily. Um, so we, uh, so, I mean, you can save a lot of money and for us on the Thrive side, we're just committed to continuing to drive that down and pass uh-huh. the value along to our customers. But again, the coolest part um, as a food nerd is right. that we're also, you're also doing good for farmers around the world. And you're also helping um, by drinking a cup of coffee, you're helping a co-op of 13 families that grow Peruvian coffee for us in the Andes. Um, mm-hmm. Live a better life, live a healthier life, get paid, and in a way that allows them to not just achieve baseline economic sustainability, but actually have abundance and and you know support their families too. And and by the way, that's one example. We have tons of American farmers we would work with too. So it's it's not just we're sourcing from other countries. We're sourcing wherever something grows and wherever it's ideal we go there and we do our best to kind of support the communities that we partner with. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we talked a little bit earlier about accountability and, and how you're looking for certifications to, to sort of speak to that accountability. Um, and I recently was reading about some of the certifications that Thrive's going after in the future in these coming years. Um, one being a, a plastic neutral company in 2023 um, by, I guess, building a, a plastic recycling program. Um, I, I would love to learn more about that. I think plastic neutral is, is this is one of the first terms I've, I've heard it. Um, it's not yet in the, quote, greenwashing that you see in, in a lot of the marketing of products right now. And it also just hasn't been necessarily a focus. Um, I would love to learn about that. Can you share a little bit about that and those, those, those lofty goals? Yeah, again, I mean, it goes back to something I said earlier. We definitely do not want to be a mission-driven company that solves for our mission and creates a number of other problems yeah. along the way, right? So for us, um, we are along with, you know, I would say most people in understanding that plastic's a huge problem. And so we, like, anytime we encounter a problem in our company, we really want to figure out what the real solution is. I think the difference to your point, and you, you mentioned the term greenwashing, the difference between us is, and others is that for us, it's part of who we are. It's part of yeah. who, our DNA. So our supply chain team and our mission team are actively working right now on some pilot programs mm-hmm. to do a number of things. So the first step is labeling all the products on the site on as to how to recycle them and what path you take as a consumer to recycle the product or reuse or, 
or throw it away if it's compostable at the end of the life cycle. Um, so we really want to be transparent about the end of life of every single product packaging vehicle that we sell. Um, so there's that piece. The next piece is um, baked into what we do. We're always looking for first, how do we reduce packaging? Um, what's this, what format is the maintains food safety, delivers the product in a high integrity way to our members, mm -hmm. but also uses the, the most minimal packaging we can find. Um, Cause reduction is the first step, right? I mean, yeah. we often gloss over that. Like, Oh, we go right to recycling. Well, how about you reduce first? Like, how about we use less and not only for uh, materials, but also carbon footprint and production. Um, so we're constantly every single product we launch from in our brand, or we talk to a, third-party brand about, we have those conversations. It's like, what are you doing on the packaging front? How do you make your packaging, you know, more plastic free, more recyclable, easier end of life for the consumer. And then the third piece is we're working on some pilot programs where we actually can take back or give our members a end of life place to ship any product that can't be recycled to so that we can then upcycle it. So we're working with a number of partners who um, take plastic materials, um, also any paperboard, painted paperboard, anything that can't be recycled for whatever reason, if it's a multifaceted, like a foil lined box or something yeah. that a product comes in, um, those can't be recycled either. So how do we capture those? Have our members, give our members a, a shipping tag or something so they can send it to someone who will actually upcycle it into building materials or um, or a jacket or, or mm -hmm. whatever can be used further down the line so that it goes into the production system and actually gets upcycled into something usable, durable, good that will not just go to landfill. Or if it does, it's years down the road. And um, so it's definitely a process and definitely yeah. something that will take a lot of time. And then on the plastic neutrality front specifically, that means how do we give people an end of life? Well, first of all, again, how do we reduce plastic? <laughs> uh, that's number one. So we're constantly striving to reduce plastic across our supply chain. Um, but then next step, how do we give our members the highest post consumer recycle content and or the most recyclable form of plastic? And then as the last step, if it can't be recycled, whether it's the material itself or in your community, you don't offer recycling or your community doesn't offer recycling. How do we give our members a way to not just throw that into landfill and actually upcycle it into some other durable good? Um, and so that's, that's the path we're on. And yeah. we're, um, you know, one thing about us is that uh, we're, we, we've had a lot of internal discussions about this, as you see large CPG companies announce you know, 2030 will be plastic free or 2045. And we're going, what? Like, that's too late. Like you have to I do agree. it now. So yeah. we're pushing hard and, you know, internally, I, I mean, it's a combination of pride, but also like, okay, are we going to be able to do this? Like, we got to do this. How are we doing this? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's definitely something that's an area of passion for the whole company. Well, I think one of the big obstacles in that is like the plastic lobby has really buried um, the truth of recycling um, and hasn't really been the most uh, f forthcoming of what can be recycled. And, and, and so you have a lot of stuff that you're throwing in there thinking that it can be uh, reused and recycled and it's not it's being shipped off to other countries or it's being thrown in a landfill. Um, so I think that first barrier of just, of telling people how they can recycle it and what this is, what kind of plastic this is, is like, one of the first crucial steps uh, in that process, and then also, um, as you as you said, like just the idea of of reducing, and that's often something we overlook, especially as we talked about earlier in a consumer driven culture. The reduction of using things is not really ever talked about. It's it's never used better or used longer. It's um, buy again, buy again, and buy again. So, I think just being really transparent. Um, and, and talking to those steps is is a, an amazing first step. And already, there, you're, I see you know leadership in that in that area. And I think a lot of places can 
can learn from that. And I have to say, like just walking into the bodegas in the, in the grocery stores in New York, it drives me crazy seeing like an orange wrapped in cellophane plastic on the shelf. I mean, there's just so much of that now. Um, are you seeing a lot of that in in Austin? Are you seeing a lot of just like erroneous use of of plastic wrap and on stuff that you're just like, why? Not as much here. I definitely have had the experience you're having. Yeah. Um, New York City, London is really bad with that too. Um, mm-hmm. Like styrofoam container with plastic wrap over a banana or something. Exactly. It's going, what are you doing? Um, Austin, we're pretty uh, eco-friendly here, like pretty mindful, which is a fortunate, fortunate thing. But I totally agree with you that it's, um, it's, there's just so much green greenwashing and so much, um, uh, so many barriers and mm-hmm. misinformation for the consumer. And, um, it's kind of amusing. Like I was saying earlier to us internally, when we're having these discussions, um, I know there's frustration sometimes because people are like, well, we're already doing more than mm-hmm. most other retailers and most other, why can't we talk about it? And from our side, we're like, well, we don't want we don't want to overstate it. Like we really want to be transparent and let people decide and, um, and then also continue to plug away. Um, I know like everyone I post on social media and I'm active and somebody just challenged me on one of my posts. Well, you guys wrap bottles in plastic. And, um, so right now we're testing compostable plastic bags that'll hold like our liquids that we ship and things Mm -hmm. like that. Um, because we were using post-consumer recycled plastic bags and, we knew we were, we just weren't happy with it. We wanted to change that as soon as we could, but we also, you know, here's the flip side, right? Like mm-hmm. there's two sides to every coin. Like we also knew if we ship glass jars or we ship something that's breakable with liquid in it and it ruins a whole shipment, then we just created all kinds of waste and an extra carbon footprint to ship, reship the order. Yep. And so there's this balancing act of like, Hey, we want to be smart and sustainable and we need to, think in a 360 kind of way about all the ramifications of that Mm -hmm. so that we are truly being the most responsible that we can be and not just going for the greenwash, like, Oh, all of our bags are post-consumer recycled. Um, And we also like, I'm a huge proponent of the, the age old saying of like not letting the perfect get in the way of the good. So I think step function is a really important part of the equation and Mm -hmm. the evolution towards the perfect, right? Like you're, you're not going to be perfect on day one. And if you can continue to move in the right direction, um, then it's really important. And the way I look at it is like, if everyone took that mindset and we were all trying to incrementally improve, especially the big CPG players and the big retailers, then we would get out of this hole much faster than we are. And, um, so it's, there's a big opportunity out there in consumer culture for sure. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and which kind of leads me to my next topic and we're getting a little bit close on time. So I'll, I'll just, I'll wrap with this next question here. Um, and it's really around regenerative farming and organic farming. And I think um, oftentimes we think, okay, organic is, is it's a, obviously a great step um, in, in choosing healthier um, products and, and, um, things that are less destructive to the environment, but um, we don't often talk about regenerative farming or regenerative organic farming. Um, so I would love it if you could like dig into what what regenerative farming is and and um, how when we're grocery shopping, if we're not shopping at Thrive, how we can look for those types of, of products and what to look for. Yeah, thanks. It's one of my favorite topics. So mm-hmm. thanks for teeing it up. I mean, I. Um, I mean, organic, for the record, organic is a great option. It is mm-hmm. less pesticides, less chemical fertilizers, less herbicides, a cleaner product for your family. So I always am uh, mindful to note, like, organic is the first step. It's far better than conventional. Um, just seeing the organic label means that there's a lot of uh, additives and chemicals and preservatives that are automatically left out because they're mm-hmm. forbidden under the USDA organic guidelines. So um, important to note that organic is the first step. Regenerative organic just moves moves the needle one step further. And um, when we say that, I mean, organic has become a monster. Um, when I started in this, doing, doing mm-hmm. this for a living, it was so small. You know, there was 
a small number of players. And usually it was regional or local where people were growing organic food and then selling it either to the local co-op or at the farmer's market. And now, you know, fast forward, whenever kind of to the first conversation we were having when we started around market demand and voting with your dollar, more and more people want organic food. They realize it's healthier. They realize it's better for them. And that's led to a lot of traditional farming methods being used like monocropping, which just means growing one crop um, for thousands of acres. Um, And you see the impact basically when you, when you farm like that, you deplete the earth every with every harvest that you have. And eventually you have to move, either move land or do something else on the land that you were farming because you only get, you know, maybe five to six seasons of that yield. And then your, your fields and your crop and your earth are, are uh, barren. So Mm -hmm. as we scale organic, um, a lot of farmers and a lot of the community kind of woke up to the fact that, Hey, even though organic is better, it's not the true solution for the earth. And it's not going to um, heal the earth the way the way it needs to in, in kind of the climate crisis that we're in. So with regenerative farming, I would say the biggest connect the dots for people is biodiversity. Um, you, it's mm-hmm. literally the opposite of monocropping. So um, we've all had the experience where you fly on a plane and you look down and you see those squares all across the middle of the country. Um, that is monocropping. The opposite of that is when you, you're planting trees, you're using cover crops, you're growing other crops in between the rows of those monocrops. So mm-hmm. um, when you fly over and you look down, you're seeing almost what looks like a forest and what looks like this dynamic agricultural environment. And um, when you're in a regenerative organic environment, you're seeing pollinators, bees, bats, birds, um, you're seeing all kinds of life. When you're in a monocrop farm, you're usually trying to get rid of all those things and you're usually yeah. seeing no life um, other than the plants that you're growing. So with regenerative, the idea is that you increase biodiversity, you go low till, no till, which means you just don't come over with giant tilling operations and tractors and till under the soil, which also has this really interesting uh, byproduct of when you till the earth, it releases the carbon that's trapped under the, under mm. the plants back into the atmosphere. So when you don't till or you, you no till, low till, if you're only doing a small amount, it actually sequesters carbon from the atmosphere in the earth, which acts as a carbon drawdown, which can lead to positive climate impact. And so um, it's interesting, a lot of regenerative farmers and scientists are saying, this can actually affect climate change in a positive Mm -hmm. way. And so um, in addition to that, in addition to crop rotations and biodiversity and and low-till, no-till, also incorporating, if you have animals on your farm, incorporating rotational grazing so that the animals plod down with their feet um, and eat all the weeds and the grass, and then they obviously poop, which leads Mm -hmm. to healthier soil, healthier earth. Um, and then obviously the last thing is composting and, and reusing biomatter from your farm to nourish the earth. Um, and that, that becomes your input for fertilizer. I've also met with a lot of regenerative farmers who have different teas, compost teas that they use for different purposes on their farm, whether that's nourishing the earth in areas where the soil isn't as fertile or pest control Um, or herb and weed control. Um, And then the last piece that I'm passionate about, sometimes you don't hear people talk about it as much, is just water responsibility. Um, Mm -hmm. Where are you farming? Are you farming in an area where there's a water supply? What are you doing with your water after it's utilized? Um, How are you reclaiming it and reusing it for multiple purposes on your farms? Uh, Again, some of the best farming operations I've been to Uh, they capture all the runoff from their farm and they're creating fish ponds and they're creating other ways to utilize the water or they're reusing the water um, in other areas of the farm after they recapture it. So um, water responsibility to me is a crucial one that often gets kind of swept, swept aside, but um, water is a precious, precious life force too. Oh, totally. I lived in California for about a year before moving to New York and um, experienced the 
the water crisis firsthand and the need to reuse and recycle as much as possible. Um, and I'm thankful that it got me in the habit of just doing small things like turning the faucet off when I do the dishes or brushing your teeth or, you know, if you have extra water in your pot instead of pouring it down the sink, water the plants or whatever. Um, so yeah. it, it's those little things that I think that, that can help. Um, is there a certification for regenerative farming? Is there a way that we can like, um, help support those types of, of farmers more directly? Yeah, it's a great question. There is a regenerative organic certification. Uh-huh. It's um, in its infancy. It's been uh, been growing with time here and more and more brands are getting on board with it. Also, you can look for the uh, Demeter Biodynamic yep. certification. Uh, Biodynamic is kind of the original regenerative farming system. Um, and then apart from that, I would say if you're not seeing either of those two certifications, uh, look for the USDA organic label and then check into the brand that you're looking at. A lot of brands, because regenerative organic is so new as a concept or as or as a, uh, as a buzzword, if you will, mm-hmm. um, a lot of organic farms are either regenerative or implementing regenerative practices. So you mm-hmm. will see if you if you just do some digging on some of the brands, um, fortunately, we're in the information age, so you can Google mm-hmm. things and do your own research, but you'll see them talk openly about biodiversity on their farms, how they're incorporating pollinators, what they're doing with composting, how they're doing rotational grazing. So it's there is a lot of good information out there, um, even if it's not being labeled as such. Okay. Well, Jeremiah, thank you so much today. I, I feel like I learned a lot. I hope our listeners did too. Um, I think there's a lot to learn in, in, in the world of food production and and how to, like you said, vote and, and pick the products that I, are doing uh, good in the world instead of uh, damage. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been an honor to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you all for listening in to my conversation with Jeremiah. If you haven't already, please head on over to the Apple Podcasts app and leave a review. Reviews are the best way for us to grow our audience and help spread the word on how to create a more sustainable and purposeful lifestyle. See you all next week.